Hey, David, how you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. You know, thanks for, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. I'm happy to. Um, so while everyone's logging on, I'll just do a brief introduction about you for people who may not know who you are, if that's okay. Sure. Perfect. Um, so we are very fortunate to have Dr. David Cutler uh, with us today. Uh, he is certainly one of the nation's preeminent healthcare experts. Uh, his background is he's a professor of applied economics at Harvard, uh, secondary appointments at the Kennedy School of Government and the School of Public Health. Uh, he was also associate dean for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, his, work, his work in healthcare economics uh, has earned him significant academic and public acclaim. Uh, as background, he served as the National Economic Advisor during the Clinton um, administration. Uh, he advised the presidential campaigns of Bill Bradley, John Kerry, and Barack Obama, and he was senior health care advisor for President Obama. Uh, he's held positions with the National Institutes of Health and the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he's currently a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a member of the Institute of Medicine. He's also a best-selling author uh, on health care and public policy, uh, including his book, Your Money or Your Life, Strong Medicine for America's Healthcare System, as well as The Quality Cure. Uh, Dr. Cutler was named one of the 30 most powerful people in modern healthcare, as well as one of the 50 most influential people in healthcare policy. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree from Harvard and his PhD in economics, and we're fortunate to have him today to discuss the ever controversial topic of healthcare in the US and what's the best solution. So again, thank you, Dr. Cutler, for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So I'm going to start out, you know, I, I think everyone's first question is that, you know, ov over many decades, dozens of the most brilliant minds, including yourself, have worked on healthcare tirelessly. And there still are so many major issues in this country. Why is healthcare in the U.S. such a difficult dilemma? Yeah, you're, so you're right. In, 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 you know, one way to view a lot of our work is, is of course, as, as we failed. Um, but another way to view it is we haven't made things perfect, but hopefully we've made things better. I, I think there are two probably fundamental aspects to this. One is that healthcare is incredibly personal. And so people are very, very hesitant about making changes as they should be. That, that's not a bad statement. It's just a, a, a statement. And so um, anytime you say, well, we need big changes in X, which, you know, people believe the healthcare system has to change a lot. People don't like doing that all at once. They don't like they're very un uneasy about it, and that's that's um, uh, that's understandable and good. I think the second reason why is um, healthcare is very complicated, and there's no universal agreement on what would be the ideal system. And in fact, it's impossible because there are always trade-offs. So there's trade-offs between which doctors can I access and when can I access them and what services should be available and how do I do it at lowest cost and what's, what happens if I want something but society doesn't think it's uh, so appropriate and so on. And so, it's, and so there's no perfect. So when you combine no perfect with hesitancy, you get a, a very big, you know, you get a lot of sort of uh, inertia in things and, and, we've, and that's what we've seen in healthcare. Got you. And what, what would you say are the, are the kind of most difficult flaws with our current healthcare system? The top three biggest flaws currently? Yeah. If it's okay, can I give you five? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. As many as you want. So the first one, it would be, so, 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 so I would say if you went back, you know, maybe a decade ago, people would have said there are three flaws. There's access, which is access is not universal. Not, a, not everybody has coverage and some who are covered don't have generous enough coverage. Second is cost. Cost is too high. Third is quality, which is haphazard. Okay, so those are the three traditional ones, and those are still problems. The fourth one that I think has come to light in the past, not come to light, but has been stressed more in the past few years, is inequities. Inequities by race, inequities by gender, inequities by geographic location, by sexual orientation, gender identity, and so on. So, and, the, and those are very big issues. And then the last one I'll add, which really has dr been driven home in the past year, is that we have a system that's designed for private health and not for public health. And that falls apart when you're then dealing with a pandemic. So all of those are, are sort of very big issues in healthcare. I mean, I think everyone's initial concern and what everyone's focused on is how do we improve 
coverage, right? There's such a mm -hmm. large percentage of the population that has no insurance. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to expand that. In your mind, what's the first step towards improving overall coverage? So I want to come, I want to, uh, come back to it, which is that the, 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 if you were to say, you know, w within things like coverage and access and so on, what are the biggest um, barriers? The single biggest barrier to covering more people is that medical care is so expensive. So we know how to get coverage, which is we create a place where you can buy it and we help you buy it. We help you financially afford it. The problem is, as that becomes more expensive, it just becomes more and more difficult to do. So if you're going to say which, which, you know, if I want to deal with coverage, what do I need to deal with? The most important thing you have to deal with is the cost. Interesting. And I mean, that leads to the next question is that the U.S. spends an obscene amount of money in terms of health care. I, I was reading in your book that that the U.S. health care system, if it broke off, would be the fifth largest GDP in the world. Mm -hmm. but why is health care so expensive in the U.S. compared to other countries? Yeah. So if you look at the U.S. versus Canada, the big single biggest difference is that the administrative costs of medical care are higher in the U.S. than in Canada. So that's the single biggest one. Canada sort of says, look, doctors, here's all the equipment you're going to have. You figure out how to use it. And the U.S. says, no, 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 we're going to haggle over every single time you want to use it. And so that U.S., process is much more administratively costly than the Canadian process is. Um, in addition, we pay more for the same things than Canada does. So we pay more for drugs than Canada does. We pay more for surgeons than Canada does, but drugs are probably a bigger issue. Uh, and then the final difference between the U.S. and Canada is that in the U.S., you're more likely to get more intensive care. You know, whenever you get you know, a doctor visit in Canada, it, not whenever, oftentimes that would come with an image in the U.S. Whenever you, you, you know, the sort of advice for people with mild blood pressure impairment, you know, high, mildly high blood pressure in the U.S. typically involves more medication than in Canada. So the, so, so um, there's that, but the, the, the more care is probably third relative to the administrative cost and the sort of paying more for drugs. Which which leads again to the next question is, you know, if, if they there was a study looking at the last 30 years and the number of physicians has gone up by about 150 percent and the number of admins has gone up by almost 4000 percent, which is just mm -hmm. ludicrous. Well, why why the explosion in terms of administrative people power? I mean, is that really necessary? Is that creating unnecessary cost? Is it superfluous? So I'm going to sound like a broken record here. The reason for that is almost is because of cost. So what happens is as the costs go up, as you can do more and more and the costs get higher, the insurance companies are under pressure from the employers to save money. And so they put in more and more requirements, which involve more and more administrative procedures, administrative hassles. So to a great extent, what a lot of those administrative costs are doing is trying to reduce the ever increasing cost of medical services. And that's, and, 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 and so, you know, so as the underlying costs go up, we just kind of, it's thinking about like, you know, there's a crack in the wall, so you wallpaper over it. And that's kind of what we do is we wallpaper over it. So you're adding admins because the cost is going up, but the admins it's increase so, the cost. So it's correct. this, it's this, it's this positive feedback cycle. Um, I mean, what about, you know, people talk about different reasons for why cost is elevated. One is the administrative stuff, which we just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, also drug prices, right? H yep. How do we get drug prices down? Yep. In almost every market, people who buy more of a thing get lower prices. You know, so if you're a doctor and you're buying stents, you get a lower price than if you're a, or a hospital buying stents than if you're a hospital and you're not buying so many stents. The one situation where that's not true is pharmaceuticals, where the U.S. is the world's biggest buyer and it gets the worst prices, the highest prices. And in fact, we've actually passed laws saying that Congress cannot use its big size to get lower prices, that we cannot, that the U.S. government cannot do that, which is kind of silly. It's like, you know, tying your hand behind your back and then complaining that it's hard to throw punches. And that's exactly what's happening. So, um, uh, so, so, um, 
some of it is really that we've sort of hamstrung ourselves in this. And we worry about innovation. We, you, know, the, you know, there's nothing that doesn't involve trade-offs in the world. And so this involves a lot of trade-offs. But some of the things that we've done are sort of to make, a, make our own lives be more difficult. It just seems interesting because the money, so the cost of healthcare is going up. The salary of doctors and nurses is not going up. It's basically staying the same. People a lot of times blame the insurance companies and the and the and the CEOs. However, I was reading in your books that that their profit margins are not are not very high. So it's not the insurance companies really. That's correct. The insurance companies pay out about eighty five cents of every dollar they take in. So. And then of that 15 cents, some of it goes to marketing, some of it goes to administrative expense, you know, all the people to look through the claims. The profit rate is only about two or three percent. One way to see that is you don't get, there, there are not a ton of companies rushing into the insurance business, right? Like usually, you know, if something's very profitable, you see companies rushing into it. You see, you know, everybody wanting and their mother wanting to open a new insurance company. So you don't see that. Insurance is not super profitable. That's not to say the sector functions well. It's got all sorts of problems, but it's not like a real business. Um, and similarly, medicine, you know, you do see, thankfully, good people want to go into medicine and, and, and so on. But it's not, um, as you said, you know, there are challenges in a lot of, of medical specialties. The, the one segment which is profitable is pharmaceuticals. And you do see a lot of new pharmaceutical companies, a lot of startup biotechs and things like that. That is one of the if you will, side effects of paying a lot for drugs is that we get a lot of entry. One of the issues for society is going to be how do we um, pay more when it's valuable to pay more and not pay more when it's not valuable to pay more. Yeah, and that's obviously a very tough dilemma to know when to do that. Um, people also blame a little bit of the cost on our legal system with all the frivolous lawsuits. In your opinion, is that a major factor in terms of driving up healthcare costs? malpractice insurance and, and so on? Um, that was believed to be a huge issue a number of years ago. And so what happened is most states put in caps on malpractice awards. The literature never suggested it, but doctors always said that they did stuff because they were afraid of being sued. So almost all states put in penalties, making it harder to sue doctors, what you can recover and so on. And more or less, not that much happened. Cost, cost growth has moderated some in the U.S. over time. That's good. Probably not a ton because of that. And there's not very much water left in that stone to squeeze out because it's been made more difficult. <clears throat> Almost all studies now show that um, the vast bulk of people who collect money from the malpractice system are people who were legitimately injured, oftentimes due to negligence. Um, you know, that the system is sort of tolerable in the sense that it's, it's, it's very costly, but it's not like giving a lot of random money to people who have absolutely no, no need for it. And that, in fact, there are a lot of people who are injured who are not compensated because they don't file or whatever it is. So I don't think it's a big problem. I, it still weighs on doctors some, and that's a reason to do, to, to do stuff about it. And there are better ways of addressing it than what we have. But as a general rule, it's probably not a big driver of the overall cost of medical care in the U.S. Got you. You know, one of the more interesting things that, that I always thought was, was fascinating was the U.S. has very poor coverage, meaning there's a large percentage of the population without any health care. Yet the top of the U.S. health care is elite, meaning that people all over the world who have money, who have means, come to the U.S. for complex procedures brain surgery, cardiac surgery, orthopedics, mm -hmm. rare conditions. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so the cost is elevated, but the quality of care in the U.S. is really second to none. Is it, is it possible that you lower the quality when you increase coverage and reduce the cost? Or in your opinion, is it possible to have, to have coverage for everyone and still maintain elite quality, which is what we have now? So it's interesting. Um, many of the things you mentioned, which are absolutely true, we have we tend to have elite quality for rare things, for which you know where experience is super important, and we have the most experienced and the most trained and the the research most research intensive docs and so on. If you say in which country are you better off? Suppose you have a 
high blood pressure and high cholesterol with, you know, sort of pre-diabetes and stuff, you know, sort of a bread and butter kind of condition. How do you do in the U.S. compared to other countries? You do no better in the U.S. In fact, you generally do worse. If you have bread and butter, common morbidity. Bread and butter, common stuff. Even though what you get is technologically more intensive, why is that? Because the drugs are so expensive, you people who of modest means decide not to buy them because getting to the doctor is such a hassle. People don't go to the doctor because the system is not set up to trace people. You wind up not knowing that the person hasn't taken his or her medications and is not doing well. So, so you wind up with um, people with routine chronic conditions actually fare worse in the US. And that's true about diabetics and people with uh, heart disease risk factors and people with mental illness and people with just a variety of other things. Because of cost, because the system is disorganized, because it's not patient oriented um, and other countries do much, much better there. So if you said to me, where would I want my bread and butter family member treated? I would say not the US. If you said, where do I want the rare brain tumor treated? I would say in the US. Our challenge is to get the bread and butter chronic disease patient to fare better in the US. And oh, by the way, that would also let us live longer as well as uh, spend less. Now, is that possible in your opinion to, to increase coverage, which would involve reducing cost? And does reducing cost inherently you know, affect the high-end medical care, the complex surgeries and what have you? Is that, are those two kind of exclusive or do you think that we can have excellent coverage and excellent quality, or do you have to sacrifice one or another? I think you can have both. One of the things that the US medical care system does is it subsidizes the elite care with the routine care. So why does the, why is the cost of caring for a cr common chronic illness so high? Because a lot of that money goes to subsidize the elite care. Well, that's a dumb thing to do if you think about it. We are taxing ordinary Americans to pay for elite care. Now, I, I believe people should have access to elite care, but I'd rather pay that full cost when we need it as a society. So I'd rather say, don't pay for that by charging you more when you have high blood pressure. Instead, just do that the way we pay for things we really want, which is through the tax system. So say, hmm. I want the cost of treating your blood pressure to be as cheap as I can possibly make it, but I understand I have to pay a lot to that elite doctor, so I'm going to do that. But I'm not going to do that by charging a lot to people with high blood pressure. Gotcha. So it's like select taxation, essentially. You know, it, if you think about it, in the automobile market, we do not subsidize the price of super expensive cars by making the price of cheaper cars higher. We could do that. We could say, you know, we want to lower the price of really super expensive cars. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to raise the price of routine cars. And then we'd find access to routine cars is difficult for people of low and modest income. And then we'd complain, what do we do about that? And the short answer is wake up and, and get yourself a better system. If you want elite cars at elite prices, then find a way to pay for them. Now, in the case of cars, we say, look, you pay for it if you want. In the case of brain tumors, we're not going to say that. But there's no reason why the way we pay for the brain tumor has to be by making the diabetic pay a ton of money. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, moving towards um, Obamacare, which you were instrumental in terms of forming that, uh, you know, many people don't understand Obamacare. Uh, obviously, you know it better than anyone else in the world. Can you summarize for the layperson just very briefly, what is Obamacare? How does it work? And why is it good? Yeah, so uh, what, what the Affordable Care Act tried to do was to deal with some of the cost and the quality and the access issues. So it said, first, we're going to expand access to medical care. How are we going to do that? Well, at the bottom, some people are at very low income, so we'll increase eligibility for Medicaid. And second, some people have a bit, income's a bit above that, but still relatively modest. So we'll create an insurance exchange, you know, healthcare.gov, where you can go and look at insurance plans and choose to buy and get a subsidy for that. So that was on the access end. And it, it was hoped that it would cover most of the uninsured, not all of the uninsured. It's covered somewhat less than that because many states have chosen not to expand the Medicaid part. 
Second is it tried to improve the cost and quality by creating models of different payment systems, you know, where payment was not based just on what the doctor did, but on caring for people better and so on. That's had a reasonable impact, not earth shattering and not terrible. So as, I, as we were talking about, the growth of medical spending has moderated and that's one reason why it hasn't fallen. But it's, but it's not going up as rapidly. So I would say it was a qualified success, not as much of a success as people hoped, and certainly nowhere near the disaster that many people were told would happen. And do you feel like, do you feel like Joe Biden is going to bring it back? Or would you like to see it come back? Or are they going to modify it? The Biden administration is a very interesting dilemma. So its first health care priority is obviously COVID-19. So it has to deal with COVID-19 and everything else is secondary until it deals with COVID-19. Um, I think that we're, in some ways, we're still fighting the battles of the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, for all the fake news we see now, the ultimate fake, you know, the original fake news was, you know, there are going to be death panels and you know the government's going to determine who lives and who dies and that was just sort of a trial run for that of that and it got a lot of people mad unnecessarily mad because people were lied to um so um i don't think it would be a wise idea to try and refight any of that the advice i i think what i think would be more productive now would be you know since we're talking about so many of the issues have to do with costs to start to say, you know what, before I think about more huge legislative solutions, I want to go after costs. I want to do everything I can to try and lower the cost of getting rid of the unnecessary administration, the pharmaceutical profits that don't need to be there. Then once I've demonstrated I can do that, then let me come back and think about what I want to do on the coverage end. Hmm. But I just don't think picking another fight over that is the right thing to do now. Got you. Now, what do you think about uh, fee for service versus a value based system? You've written a lot on this, and I think it's 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 an interesting kind of comparison fee for service where the doctor or the hospital is paid based on the tests or the procedures. Obviously, there's an incentive there to do more versus a value based system where the hospital, or the doctors paid X amount of dollars for a certain condition and the testing and what have you, whatever they're going to do is up to them to decide. Yep. Um, should we be going towards a value-based system or a fee-for-service system? Okay, so let me first say there's no perfect. We don't know the perfect. Um, the, the, the consequence of a fee-for-service system is doctors do too much because they're paid at the margin for doing everything. The consequence of a value-based system is a doctor may do too little because if, it doesn't, if you're not monitoring the outcomes cr carefully enough, crucially enough, then you wind up with... Um, too little, you can wind up giving incentives to stint on stuff. So there's no, so I'm not going to claim and nobody can claim to you that there's a perfect. Relative to where we are, the experiments that we've done with value-based payments so far have been very encouraging. So they have re resulted in reduced spending. And as best we can tell, the outcomes have been not only not worse, but actually better because by managing the patient better, you can save some money from the high end. So I think relative to where we are, we, the evidence suggests we should certainly be moving more in the value-based payment way. But that is an empirical statement, not a theoretical statement. And that's a statement about what we've observed so far. And it's entirely possible to overdo and underdo and all those other things. Now, speaking about outcomes, how do how do you measure healthcare quality, right? That's a very subjective term. What is good healthcare? What is bad healthcare? What's a good outcome? What's a bad outcome? You know, should we be measuring quality and should quality be available to the patient when they go see a doctor? You know, yes, is there a yes. rating? This is the complication rate. This is the discharge date. This is the readmission rate. You know, are, are we gonna have quality, you know, objective measures? Yes and yes, we should be measuring them. They should be available to patients. So far, most patients do not think about healthcare as an area where they get have readily available quality metrics, ironically, even though it's so important that quality be high in medical care. Um, one of the administrative complications of the US is we do a lot of quality measurement by hand. 
So, you know, every doctor and every nurse has stories of, you know, I have to spend hours and days gathering this information because, um, you know, the insurer requires it or CMS requires it or somebody requires it and, and you know, and then I have to go doing it. Now that medical care has been made substantially electronic, we should be able to do that much easier. We will never be perfect in quality measurement because medical care is so complicated and you know so on and so forth. Just like we're never going to be perfect in measuring the quality of different schools or measuring the quality of different teachers. But we can do a better job than we're doing. And then once we do that, that gives us more confidence to move to things like quality-based payment because at least there's a shared understanding that, what, that the measures that we have are meaningful and useful and really indicative of good quality. Yeah, I think that the, that the general public, unfortunately, has this notion that a doctor is a doctor is a doctor, and they went to medical school, and all doctors are good. And that, unfortunately, as, as, as you know, there are good doctors and bad doctors, average doctors, just like mm -hmm. there's good and bad economists mm -hmm. and business people mm -hmm. and lawyers. So mm -hmm. I think it's important for people to know that just because someone is a doctor doesn't mean they're good and they have to do their research. Um, yeah, what ironically, one of, the, one of the issues is... Um, when you, when you, uh, you know, when, like a lot of things, you can improve quality a lot just by getting rid of the really bad performers. Correct. And yet most people believe that they're doc like, you know, my guess is, I don't, I haven't seen a statistic, but I wouldn't be surprised if 80% of people thought their doctor was above average, which yeah. just arithmetically can't be true. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, so, so it's very difficult to get rid of bad doctors. And whenever insurers try and say, we're not going to contract with, you know, Dr. Cutler because he's a quack and he's, you know, killed his last 17 patients, you know, invariably the, the patients, you know, his, his surviving patients come and say, oh, no, we love him and he's great and so on and so forth. So it, it, it's, it's oftentimes very difficult to do that. Yeah, it's tough, but I feel like there needs to be some kind of standard, some kind of metrics that's objective that people can see that, okay, this doctor compared to other doctors in the exact same field, above average, average, below average, because we have a lot of doctors that go unmonitored, and that's obviously a real problem. One of the things that would be good it would be if sort of state medical societies and professional societies and so on decided they really wanted to get into this and say, look, we're going to decide what it means to be a good ophthalmologist, what it means to be a good cardiologist, what it means to be a good neurologist and then we're going to issue grades and and or we're going to put this out there and say here you can you can use these to form grades and we're going to stand behind them yeah that's definitely one way to do it um what's your opinion on socialized medicine so england canada everyone kind of points to those countries as having excellent coverage you know it's a hundred percent coverage it's socialized uh however People who have the means in England or Canada who have a complex condition always come to, or you know, usually come to the U.S. What's your opinion on their medical systems, coverage, quality-wise? Is that something we should be working towards? So every country has some socialized healthcare and some free market healthcare. In fact, those terms don't even really mean all that much <laughs> because it's all in the gradations. So, for example, in the U.S., we run a side by side a socialized medicare program and a private insurance system in the uk they run a socialized national health service and you can have private insurance in canada there's no private insurance and there's no you can't pay a doctor privately for something that that medicare pays for but as you said you can come to the us and occasionally people do come to the us not as many for medical reasons as one thinks but but some do so there's no, it's, this is not an all or one choice. Um, the thing about the world's healthcare systems, they all have some, almost all have more government involvement than the US does. And partly the reason why our administrative costs are so high is because the private insurers are struggling to do what they can in the absence of a government saying, here's what I'm going to do. So partly that, so, so, so the US tends to be relatively more I think you froze there. Dave, you there? He's probably getting a phone call or something. David, you there? We'll give him a 
another minute there while he, uh, oh, hold on. I guess he got bounced out. Hold on one second. Let me get him back in. Anyone have any questions before we wait for him to get on for the last two minutes here? Such an abrupt ending there. I wanted to ask him what, what country he thinks has the best healthcare system in the world. That's kind of what I'm waiting for here. Well, that might be all for the interview, guys. I think Dr. Cutler had some issues there. Give him another minute or so. Do I allow pre-med students to shadow you? I do, but not during, uh, not during COVID. They don't allow observers here. But hopefully over the summer, maybe the fall, things will open up again. And before COVID, we had I don't know, dozens of observers, high school, college, medical students. Let's see if there he is. Hold on, I'm gonna pull him back in. He's back, hold on. Hey, David. Hey, can you hear me? Hello there. Hey. Hi there. Yep, I assume th that you got a phone call or something? That always happens. No, um, what happened was that um, I had my iPhone on its charging. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And then it announced that it was too hot. <laughs> and it was shutting down on me. Okay. Well, <laughs> well we're back. And uh, I just had a couple more questions. We're going to wrap up because I know you're super busy. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask, do you think that we should go to universal Medicare here in the U.S. to cover everyone, which is what a lot of people are pushing for, with a tiered system that if you have the means, you can pay for higher end services? Is that something you would advocate for? You know, one model that might make sense in the U.S. is not Medicare, where everybody's on the traditional government policy, but Medicare like Medicare Advantage, where you get a choice of different policies and, you know, you can pay more and get more benefits. You can pay less and get fewer benefits, where there would be one public plan so that, you know, it's guaranteed there's something there for everybody and it's not all just private insurance, but where there's a lot of choice. And seniors are very happy with Medicare and with Medicare Advantage. A third of them are in Medicare Advantage and so on. That looks a lot like what most big employers do. They offer choice and there are a bunch of policies and you can choose. So, so that's a possibility for us is to go that way. Um, I think as a general matter, we, we don't, we, as a country, we tend not to be in favor of policies where people get what you're eligible for is substandard care, but you can pay more to get more. And my own personal sense is we can lower the cost by getting rid of inefficiencies without saying you can't get brain surgery. So I'd rather say, let's get rid of the inefficiencies and then say, you know what, if that's 10, 12% of GDP, I'm okay spending that. And I, and I, and I don't wanna say you can't get brain surgery, but I really wanna get rid of the administrative folks we don't need and the pharmaceutical prices that are too high and stuff like that, I'd much rather do that yeah for sure um and now you know for the final question which is like the million dollar question i would say if you consider access and quality of care in your opinion what country in the world has so far the most optimal healthcare system in your opinion so um i'll give you an answer but first let me say that i think it's very difficult to transport from one country to another so there's a famous health economist named Uwe Reinhardt who unfortunately passed away recently. And someone asked him, do you think that the Danish healthcare system would be a good model for the US? And he said, yes, especially if you give me the Danish population. <laughs> so so, so um, the countries that tend to do best are the sort of richer Northern European ones, France, Switzerland, um, Sweden, places like that. 
they often have some choice. So they tend not to be, you know, the government is running everything. You know, you have choice of different insurers or people have cho certainly have choice of different medical care providers and so on. But because the government is overall in charge, the constraints make it be that it's affordable for everybody. And the outcomes look better and the costs look lower and things like that. So I think out of all the countries out there now, those are the ones that I admire the most. But at the same time, I think it would be foolish to say, let's um, uh, just transport any more than I think we should say, hey, you know what? Neurosurgeons have a good way of organizing their practice. Let's make the cardiologists organize their practice the same way that the neurosurgeons do. Yeah, like, not going to work. In, in, in what planet is that the right way to do it? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no planet. Obviously, it, it, it's not, you can't just translate that over. There's so many differences, um, which is why healthcare is such a difficult dilemma, and it really right. brings us full circle. Yep. Yep. Um, but, you know, just, just wrapping up, Dave, I wanted to say thank you again for your time. Uh, such, a, such a difficult and yet fascinating topic. Thank you for all the work you do on this. Uh, hopefully, there's some improvement in, you know, in the next four to eight years. It's just such a it's so difficult, so many moving parts, so many flaws in the system, like you said. And again, thanks for people like you who are working on it hard. Well, and thanks to people like you who help to bring these issues out and to raise them in for doctors and patients and everyone else, too. And, it, and it's just super important. Absolutely. It's, it's, I think it's the number one dilemma after COVID. I guess it's kind of all intertwined. But healthcare in the U.S. is probably the biggest issue that we're having here in this country. And hopefully we can make some strides forward. Agreed, very much. All right, David, again, thanks for your time, all right? Much okay. appreciated. Take okay. care, be well.